man, it's a strange time for me. You ever, you ever have this where this portal of time opens up and you get kind of sucked back? You think you're driving forward, looking through the windshield. Turns out the windshield is the rear view and then you're just squirted out backwards down the stairs of time and dumped unceremoniously into the broken pottery of your history. And for me, it's like, okay, try to assemble, try to assemble, try to assemble. I don't know why it's exactly happening. Maybe it's a half century thing. Um, I don't know, but it's wild. And I think there's some great value that's coming out of it that I sort of want to talk about with you today. Philosophy is a complex topic, and sometimes it's pure syllogisms, and sometimes it's arguments from first principles, and sometimes it's a narrative so personal that it spills over into the universal. And I was raised by a single mother. I was raised, and and most of my male friends at the time, when I was sort of young, were child, uh, children of single moms, sons of single mothers as well. Why? Because we lived uh, in the, you know, low rent, dirty water, roach infested rat traps called rent controlled single mom households. Basically, it was you know, the matriarch of manners. Um, and so I had that and I was then to some degree saved by an intact family that sort of took me in. So <laughs> it's their fault. Uh, if you love and hate what I do, you can love or blame them. But I wanted to talk about this incredibly common phenomenon these days of being a son raised by a single mother. Because I think it's essential and I think it's critical at the moment that we understand the effects of this. So it's going to be some personal narrative, some general arguments, and I hope that you'll find it helpful. And I really, really think it's important. If you know someone raised by a single mom, if you yourself are raised by please give me, give me the time. It will... It will pay off for you, I promise. Now, one of the big problems that single moms have is in this realm of authority. Authority. It's a huge problem. And it's not just because as a son, you end up bigger than your mother, generally. You know, with my mom, it was one thing when she was, you know, yelling down at me. It's another thing when she was yelling up at my nostrils. And... This question of authority goes back very, very deep. It tends to come out very viscerally in the teenage years, right? In the, the, post, the puberty and post-puberty years, uh, the, the lack of respect, the lack of authority that the single mom has tends to come out. But the foundations are laid way earlier, and I really want people to understand this. When you are raised by a single mom, you have a question, which is, where's dad? Where's dad? Why do I not have a father? Now, of course, some fathers are more proximate. Some fathers are 50-50. Mine was not. Mine was in another continent. But you have this question. Why don't I have a father? The associated question, why are we always broke? Why is there no time? Why is there no parent to play with me? Why is there no parent to instruct me? That is kind of tertiary question, but why don't I have a father? The single mothers that I knew had to distort reality, had to distort human nature, had to lie so foundationally that I think it sows the seeds of a genuine kind of madness that seems to be racing through society like an invisible fire through cracked, dried, and broken trees. And the fundamental lie goes something like this. You don't have a father because men are deceitful. Men are liars. Men are bad. And they fool you 150%. You don't have a father because your father was nice. He was charming. He was wonderful. He was great. And then he turned on me like an instantaneous photocopied rabies. He just switched. And that's why you don't have a father. Because when you're a kid and there's no dad around, there are really only a couple of possibilities that you puzzle through or reason about. One is that your mother was good, but your father was bad. But then what your mother has to say, if your mother was good, but your father was bad, then the goodness of your mother is called into question because she chose a bad father for her children, right? So if you're 
mother is plus 100% good and your, your father is minus 100% good, 100% bad, then why would a good person choose to date, to get engaged to, to get married to, to have children with and stay married to for some time? If he's very bad, bad enough that he had to leave, she had to get away, she had to get out, bad enough to sacrifice the quality of your childhood, the income that you otherwise could have had, the stability, the happiness, the additional resources you get as a child by having two parents. If he was so bad that your needs as a child had to be sacrificed, if he turned into a kind of cougar or rabid bear that you just had to flee, then what was she doing with him in the first place? Does she fall into this, the single mom, does she fall into this very boring and cliched yet still under-examined aspect of female nature, which is, I want a good man. However, I'm going to open my legs for a bad man. And then I'm going to complain to the good man about the bad man, thus keeping him on deck, keeping him as the backup beta simmer on the back burner guy for when I get older. And then I want him to devote resources to raising the children of the bad man. <sighs> Where have all the good men gone? <laughs> They've not gone anywhere. They're just waiting for you to tire of the bad men so that, uh, well, these days they can just say no. Well, they can't really say no because of the welfare state, so their money's going to be taxed to support the offspring of bad and unreliable men no matter what, which is how you spread the, jeeds, spread the seeds of bad men and prevent the seeds of good men from spreading. <sighs> so if your mom is good but you chose a bad man, she can't be that good, right? If your mom is bad and a good man chose her, then she drove a good man away. Now, his virtue, equivalent to hers, his virtue, is put into question because he chose a bad woman to be the mother of his children. However, I give the excuse that men propose dating, sex, romance, marriage, and women choose, right? Men propose, women dispose. Men ask, women say yes or no. And so the man is going to pursue, you know, romance, sex, marriage or whatever. And the woman says yes or no, which is, you know, men ask women out 90% of the time. Majority of men are still paying for uh, dates. Uh, men propose, uh, men ask and women say yes or no. So the woman is more responsible for the formation of the marriage than the man is. That's the price you pay. That responsibility is the price you pay for being uh, pursued, for being wooed, right? All that. So, so if, if the man, if the, the dad, the missing dad, if he was a good man, then she drove a good man away. If, she was, if he was a bad man, then she chose a bad man to have children with. There's really not that many possibilities. So what do single moms have to do? either explicitly or implicitly, when it comes to that basic question of why is there no father around? Well, she has to denigrate masculinity as a whole. Because if there are lots of good men around, let's say that men are 75% good, right? Three quarters of men, three out of four men are good. If most men are decent, good, solid, earnest, pleasant, good-natured providers, then she chose the one Asshole. She chose the one bad man. Unreliable, inconstant, right? And so if, even if it's 50-50, if 50% of men are good, 50% of men are bad, she still chose a bad man. And that means her judgment is terrible. So she has to then, in order to escape this basic problem of why is there no dad around and how do I explain that? And I'm mostly going to talk about the sons here. Um, I'll let women do the experiences of being raised by single moms or single dads. Although single dads, half as likely to be in poverty as single moms. There's lots of benefits to that. But So this basic question, why is there a giant cut-out hole in the family portrait where daddy used to be? The moms have a very, very tough time answering it. Because if they say, well, he was a bad man, well, then you, cho you chose a bad man. So then they have to say, well, he was a bad man, but he perfectly camouflaged himself as a good man. But then the question is, how many men can do that? I mean, let's just say there's this weird sociopathic chameleon cloaking device, this like Romulan exterior ward cleaver shell that crazy evil men can project and fool women for years 
be wonderful, great providers, good friends, fool them, fool their girlfriends, their sisters, their brothers, their parents, everyone at the wedding, everyone afterwards, extended family, they fooled everyone. And these men who were able to fool all, all the people and fool your mom into thinking they were some great guy, but turned out to be a mean, nasty, ugly, vicious, cheating, ha! Not only did they fool everyone, but there was no indication in the man's history that he had a dysfunctional upbringing that remained unprocessed in adulthood, right? He didn't come from a single mother household himself. Neither of his parents had any significant emotional or mental problems. He did not drop out of school. He did not have a lot of tattoos. He did not have, a, he did not have any problems with drugs. He did not have any problems with the law. There was no, he was steadily employed. He, you understand? He had to be a perfectly formed cloak that fooled everyone completely 150% with no prior indicators before even dating, before getting engaged, before getting married, before having kids, no prior indicators of any dysfunction or any problems. He never had a temper, was never unreliable, always had a job, always calm, focused, positive, good. Mm. Now, it's impossible to miss that there are good men out there. And so if the mom, if she spins this tale that that people can perfectly appear good, but then end, end up really bad. They can carry off this per perfect mask for years, but then end up really, really bad. That makes the child paranoid. Of course, of course the child grows up paranoid because the whole history has been twisted. Of course, of course, if the dad was a bad guy, there were signs beforehand. There were tons of signs you can read Ah, psychiatrists who've reported this, that every single time they, the, the woman gets beaten up by her boyfriend or her husband and they say, well, is there any indications that he was violent beforehand? Was, oh, yes, there was. Yeah, drugs, criminal record, no, no employment and violence and in his past and terrible family. I mean, there's tons of signs, tons of signs. So what you need to do is you need to set kids up in order to preserve the transitory, quote, integrity of the single mom, or rescue her reputation. You have to set up this weird... Situation. It's like the rebooted Battlestar Galactica where the glowing orgasm spine Cylons are indistinguishable. It's invasion of the body snatchers. The evil people are indistinguishable from the good people, you see. Can't tell them apart. You can invest for years in someone you think is perfect, has all the signs of perfection and fools everyone. And then they pull back the mask. Out comes the Beelzebub of dysfunction and predation and violence and cheating. People might seem good, they might appear good, but they're just waiting to pounce after years of fooling you. Now, go out and enjoy your life, honey. <sighs> you see, the paranoia of the absolution of personal responsibility. If you absolve yourself of personal responsibility for making bad choices in life, there's nothing else but, but paranoia. Nothing else but paranoia. Right, I mean... If you keep walking into trees, because you're not paying attention, staring at your cell phone, keep walking into trees, and then you say, well, the solution is to blindfold myself. Now you can't really go anywhere. Paranoid. So that's a huge problem with single moms. They have to create this narrative where they're the victim, which produces paranoia on their part and infects the child, particularly the son, with paranoia. Because if the story is, well, there are these evil people out there who for years and throughout their entire personal histories can perfectly mask themselves as good people. Who is the child to trust ever? Who is the child to trust? Can't trust anyone. Because anyone, <laughs> rip off the mask. And out of the good man comes the bladed tongue of the acid-blooded alien to rip off your head. Terrify Ted Cruz's child. That's hugely dysfunctional. Horrible, horrible situation. Just to rescue her own reputation. Just to rescue her own reputation. Her own... And, and nobody believes it. Nobody fundamentally believes it at all. And so this is where the foundation is laid, as I said, for this loss of authority. If someone lies to you, you know, like... You see those videos on YouTube, you know, 
kids caught in the act or whatever. And there's some kid smeared with chocolate and they say, have you been eating chocolate? No. No. Why? But this is how it looks. The kid unconsciously is looking at the mom who says, all men are liars and cheaters. Because if I chose a bad man when there were good men around, then I have a bad reputation with regards to my own children because my own irresponsibility and bad choices and selfishness and greed and lust or whatever it was going to be, my own focus on shallow surface sexual lust rather than finding a man to build the foundation of a good family, a stable, lasting family. I made catastrophic decisions that have you being raised without a father, without money, without additional resources, without a mentor and a role model for your masculinity. I screwed and screwed up catastrophically. She has to say, well, either good men are indistinguishable from bad men, which makes the kid paranoid, or all men are bad. And this is how I grew up when I was a kid. I was born in 1966. I grew up, it was men are pigs, male chauvinist pig, patriarchy. All men, you see, are bad. And the toxic masculinity is just a cover. The more single mothers you get in your society, the more you have to slander. Masculinity, the more you have to pour hatred and fear and paranoia and rape culture on masculinity. Because if all men are bad and all men can fool women all the time, sure, sure, I guess single mothers are off the hook. There ain't no locks for ghosts that can walk through walls and there ain't no protection for your heart to patriarchy that can fool you and is everywhere and there's no exception. I didn't choose a bad man. All men are bad. So she's a little bit off the hook. But the problem is you get boys who grow up paranoid and self-hating and you get girls who grow up paranoid and self-hating and then they're easy prey for the social justice warriors and high school and higher education. The victimhood that is necessary to temporarily rescue the reputation of single mothers corrupts the entire relationships between the genders. And then you get this funny thing too, because you've probably heard this a million times about, let's say girls in science or girls in math. You see, if girls and math, if girls when they're growing up see female mathematicians, see see female scientists, see female entrepreneurs, see female executives and CEOs and politicians and so on, then it's a role model for them, you see. And, and, and role models are so important for girls, for, for blacks, for Hispanics. You've got to have these positive role models out there that you can aspire to. Role models are essential for the victims, for the underperforming, for whatever, right? However, when it comes to boys, and in particular white boys, Role models don't matter at all. Having a father around who teaches you how to be a a man who brings you from, you know, the moms can bring you from infancy to boyhood, but it takes a man to bring you from boyhood to manhood, right? Moms are great at raising toddlers. Men are essential for adults. There's overlap, of course. And so you end up in this situation where everyone desperately needs a mentor to achieve their potential, except boys. Boys don't need mentors at all because the mom can teach a boy how to be a man. Now, in order to make that even vaguely credible, you have to say there's no difference between the genders. You understand that that's where all of this gender fluidity stuff is coming from. It's coming from if there are differences between men and women and if children need strong mentors in order to grow up achieving their potential, then the absence of fathers is catastrophic for boys. And the women who've chose men who don't stick around or who've driven away good men have really, really messed up. And we should be very angry at them. Right? If society worked very hard to keep any positive mention of scientists or female scientists or mathematicians away from women, we'd get upset, right? Say, no, 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 the women need, the girls need their role models so they know it's possible they can inspire to it and become it and inhabit it and grow into it. They need their role models like... The oak sapling needs the sunshine and the rain and the earth and the nutrients and the crap of the earthworms and stuff, right? You have to dissolve differences between genders in order 
to protect the single mother substate in society. The welfare state, the dependence on the state, the single mothers voting left. I mean, this is all part of the general leftist communist plan to replace freedom with central planning, coercion, totalitarianism. And so, why don't boys need mentors and role models? Well, because there's no difference between men and women. Women, historically, have been dependent on men, and men have been enslaved to their families. Women get pregnant, and would generally get pregnant every year or two, at a minimum, from the age of like 13 to 15 until 30 to 40. And during that time, women would have a tough time working, they would have a tough time getting their own food, they'd have a tough time hunter-gathering. Why? Because they've got, you know, a pond tadpole full of little bairns worming around their feet, demanding milk and food and attention and time and care and washing and, right? So they they were helpless and dependent upon their men. And the men were helpless and dependent upon the needs of their family. Men have to produce 10 times the amount of resources if they have a family than if they were single, right? So it wasn't like patriarchy, we all win and femininity, you're all crushed. Everybody was enslaved to each other because of the scarcity of resources and the unpredictability of the environment. Oh no, it rained on the crops at the wrong time. Now we get to starve. I mean, it was just wretched time. And, you know, in hunter-gatherer societies, you have 50% mortality rate for kids and so on. And so if you want to get women to reject men, to be angry at men, then what you do is you point out the fact that women are dependent on men and you can specifically exclude the fact that men are enslaved to women, right? I mean, you, 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 if you have a family, you, you go out, you earn a paycheck, you come home, you put your paycheck down, and uh, basically a bunch of jackals come in and rip your money limb from limb. And it's fine, it's wonderful, it's natural, it's the way things should be, I, I have no problem with it. But what you do is you say to women, ah, you were enslaved throughout history and a patriarchy had it easy, Blah. You ignore the fact that men have to work to support their families, and uh, that's pretty uh, anxiety-provoking. You ignore the fact that men die before women. You ignore the fact that men were generally drafted to go into war. Um, All of that, right? And you just, you make women resentful of men. Because they're still going to want to have kids, and and they're still going to want to be moms. And because they're resentful towards men, good men don't want to be around them, right? If you can, the more you can provoke resentment against men in, in women, the less that men want to be around them. <laughs> Patriarchy, male show, and it's It's horrible, right? It's gross. A mosquito in your ear, right? <laughs> Never dies. So you have to convince women that they've been victimized. Oh, and of course, because victimhood is such a powerful thing for women, right? Women's strength is their pretend weakness. Because victimhood is so powerful for women. You know, be be a woman crying in society and everyone's like, oh, what can I do to help? Be a man crying in society and they're like, whoa, let's just step around this guy. What's going on with that? Man up. (laughs) Stop having feelings. He's emotionally unavailable. (laughs) Sad but true. So then you need this big giant welfare state because when women have children... They're tired. They're up all night. They're breastfeeding if they're decent moms for the recommended year to year and a half so that the kids' brains can grow. They get decent IQs, good chance of success in life. So if women say, well, I don't need no man. Woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Hey, I just had two kids. Ooh, guess you need men now, don't you, honey? And, And even if you're in the welfare state, you still need men because the taxes are, taxes are overwhelmingly levied on men in society. And they're collected by, generally, male police officers and enforced, generally, by male courts. So, if you've got a welfare state, you need a giant patriarchal, quote, patriarchal state to go and get money from men to give it to women. (laughs) You've not achieved independence. You've just achieved, quote, independence at the expense of having to make anybody a sandwich. So, that's why you need a welfare state, and that's why you need to blur the lines between men and uh, women because then you can pretend that women can raise boys just as easily as men can raise boys and it's not true 
It's not true. So the single mom needs to portray herself as a victim of a sociopathically manipulative and masked evil masculinity that is basically all, all men, pigs, all men are cheaters, all men. And then what she has to do is she has to keep decent men away from the, from the boy. Because if the boy grows up and there's like a couple of decent men around, a couple of nice, good men around, then she, he would basically say, well, why didn't you marry one of them? Why did you marry this guy you say is bad? Why, did you, why didn't you just marry a nice guy? So she's got to keep them away. The hatred of the father that to some degree protects the reputation of the single mother. He's bad. I'm good. He's bad. I'm good. I chose a bad guy, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There were no good guys to choose, and he fooled everyone in the lot, right? This hatred of the father metastasizes into hatred of masculinity as a whole. And this is why single moms can't raise boys. I mean, one of the many reasons. Single moms can't raise boys because in general, again, there's tons of exceptions and you can bore everyone if you want in the comments to this video by saying, well, I don't hate men and I'm a single mother and I told the truth. I get it. I understand. Yes, yes, yes. You're just you're short Dane. You're the tall pygmy. I understand. Just don't bore everyone with it, right? I'm the exception to the rule. <laughs> Yeah, prove the rule, because you're the exception. You understand? Okay, so please don't. <laughs> please don't. That's just, uh, don't say I'm smarter than that. And then, Anyway, so to protect the reputation, to protect herself from criticism, she pours hatred on the father, which then metastasizes the hatred of all masculinity. But the boy is half the father. The boy is half the father, and he's all man. So if the reputation of the woman is protected by pouring hatred on masculinity, not only can she not raise the boy, she's a toxic, she's an environmental toxin to the boy. Men are bad, men are pigs, men are patriarchs. No trustworthy men around. No good men to choose. But I'm going to teach you how to be a man. Well, she can't teach him how to be a man because she, in general, she's defined masculinity as negative, as toxic. And you see this as the growth of single mother. It's very predictable. As single motherhood spreads in society, the perception of toxic masculinity spreads as well. You understand why? It's not an objective evaluation of anything at all. And to say to a man, to say to a boy, your father's terrible. The boy knows he's half his father, biologically. Maybe he's seeing, getting influence from his father, I don't know. Father is terrible. Oh, and also, <laughs> if the mother, the single mother, cut off relations with the father, divorced him, and two-thirds of divorces are initiated by women, number one reason, abuse, no. Violence, no. Addiction, no. Dissatisfaction. You know, sorry you have to be raised in poverty without a father. Sorry you have no resources. Sorry I'm tired and stressed and overwhelmed all the time. Sorry I'm a screeching bundle of jumpy nerves. Sorry I'm desperate to try and bag a man with the liability of children hanging off my leg. Sorry about all of that, but see, mommy was dissatisfied. So either she got rid of the father because he was just a terrible guy, in which case she's got terrible judgment. Or she got rid of the father, he wasn't that bad, or maybe he was fine, in which case the message is very clear to the son, to the daughter too, I imagine. If you just please mommy, you get tossed out in the snowbank. She will break relations with you if you displease her. She's a tyrant. She's a tyrant. And like most tyrants, the most dangerous when she's in a good mood. But... There's no good solution to this. Once you separate a son from his father, your credibility is gone. And again, this is all buried with, you know, in, in childhood, in, in infancy, in toddlerhood, in the latency period, and so on. Up until puberty, this stuff is generally buried. Because you don't, in a sense, it's less important to teach a boy how to be a man while he's still a boy. Of course, right? once he becomes, once he makes a transition to masculinity, to adulthood, puberty, and post-puberty, then it becomes important. You got all these hormones, this anger, this rage, this frustration, loneliness, isolation, a sense of lostness. Do you know how I learned how to shave? 
I learned how to shave by going to the library and finding a magazine from the 1950s where there was a demonstration of, I don't know, some new shaving cream or something. Okay, here's how you... You couldn't teach me. My mom couldn't teach me. It's that ridiculous. It's that lunatic. So, and this is another reason why when people push back against collective statements, well, not all women are like this, not all this are like this, you can't make collective statements. Oh, come on. For anyone who grew up post-feminism, for anyone who grew up in the 60s and afterwards, the idea that there's something wrong with making collective statements is so ridiculous, I don't even know what to say. Men are pigs, there's rape culture, there's patriarchy, there's the... Okay, so collective statements are made about men all the time. Then a man dares to make a collective statement. Oh, <gasps> misogyny. <laughs> right? Ah, I don't know. The idea that collective statements are bad. If, you, if, if you're, particularly if you're a white male, you've been on the receiving end of so many collective statements. White privilege, patriarchy, racism. That no, but no, there's no credibility left whatsoever to even the vague idea that collective statements are bad. You can't make collective judgments. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when everyone else stops, I don't know, then maybe they'll get some traction to the idea that collective statements are bad. So here's another problem too. Uh, kids gain security by being loved, by being valued, by being treasured. I, that's not controversial. I get everyone understands that. Now, here's the problem, one of the many problems. For, for children to be enjoyable, you have to enjoy raising them. If you're a single mom, particularly if you're working at whatever you're working at, it's hard being a parent. You know, single moms are like stretched thin, you know, they used to say about the ring... Feel like what is it? Butter on toast, spread too thin. They're stretched too thin. They're high strung. They're worried. They're just sleepless. They're tense. They're jumpy. They're right. It's it's nerve wracking having that sole responsibility for children, uh, not having anyone to share it with, not having anyone. I mean, it's it's really stressful. It's difficult. And so you can't really enjoy parenting very much if you're a single mom. Now. The kid, the moms who are home on welfare, well, the, the tragic truth is that they barely talk to their kids. Statistically, kids hear more words from working moms than they do from staying at home moms. Now, that's partly an IQ thing, but it's also partly, a, you know, they're, they're just little ATMs in diapers, right? Ka-ching! Government money! Hey, ooh, do I need to put them on psychotropic meds in order to get more government money? Here go the pills, honey! Take down those pills! Sorry, they're going to shrink your brain mass by about 10%, but... Mommy needs a handbag. <sighs> what happened to us? God, what happened to us? Well, I think we know. I think we know. So, instead of kids being a great pleasure and an addition to your life, kids are a source of stress. They are a source of emotional stress, time stress. They're a source of money stress and, and worry. And you get frazzled. You know, like... This is a constant thing that you hear. Women feeling overwhelmed. Literally shaking. Feeling overwhelmed. Well, you're overwhelmed because you're trying to parent alone. And you're trying to parent alone in general because you made bad choices. Because you did not learn about yourself. You no self-knowledge, no wisdom, no history. And you cast aside good guys in order to sleep with sexy bad dudes, right? Stubble in a broken motorcycle. I'm in. Hey, I'm only going to have sex with you if you have at least three Cars of 10 years of age or more up on blocks in your front yard. Mowed the lawn? <laughs> I don't think so. Here's a guy. He's 26. He's building his own treehouse. Love to have sex out there. Ooh, mommy gets dicey for slivers. So, if kids are uh, uh, difficult, troublesome, stressful, expensive, then it's hard to really enjoy being a parent. And it's hard to really love your kids. You know, you love your kids like a bear in the backyard. <laughs> It's kind of cool as long as you're behind glass, but if you're out there, ooh, stressful. And so 
Kids don't get that kind of attachment. They don't get that kind of, you are a wonderful treasured addition to my life, which is where kids get their security from and their trust and their ability to handle negative emotions, right? If you don't have a strong bond with your mother, you can't handle negative emotions. You have to avoid them. You have to suppress them. You have to, right? The safe space that people claim they need in adulthood results from the fact that they didn't have any safe spaces when they were kids. The space, like, if the single mom dumped the dad because he disagreed with her, how can you have disagreements? You can have this paranoia of being dumped. You know, kids need resources. They know that and we're evolutionarily designed, so to speak, to just do whatever it takes to get resources. If that means we got to conform and do the chicken dance and say, yes, mom, no, mom, three bags full, mom, to everything mom says, then that's what we'll do. Because kids who fundamentally displeased their parents ended up on top of an Aztec pyramid, their hearts being ripped out with (laughs) Wolverine scissor hands and being fed to the sky gods, thrown uh, off Hawaii into shark pits. You know, I mean, they didn't do well, is what I'm saying. So we we conform. We conform. So you can't disagree because your mom's on edge, your mom's tense, your mom's overwhelmed. Don't be that straw that breaks the maternal batch. And so kids perceive themselves a lot in single mom households as liabilities. We're in the way, we're a problem. Mom could have this wonderful, exciting, amazing life flowing down the red carpet in Os- Oscar La Renta, dressed with an Hermes bag, flashbulbs popping in her face on the arm of some movie star. That could be her life. Blanche Dubois on the cover of Vogue. She could be thin. She could be paid for. She could have things bought for her. She could be nothing but 400 thread linen tablecloth, caviar, crab, all these wonderful dishes. She had this amazing life. Except for these kids. I remember this. I remember this. I remember this. Feeling of being a liability, feeling of being in the way, feeling of being, um, you know, as my mom used to say, if I'd sit and walk in front of her in the TV or sit there and block her view from something, she'd say, you're a pain, you're just not a window pane. <laughs> it's really funny. It's great, you know, because that's what you want to do is tell kids continually that they're liabilities. They're in the way of mommy's happiness. Now, that's just the overwhelmedness of just planning and organizing and running a household with kids if you're a single mom. But that's the problem of sexual market value as well. Because until men got indoctrinated into manning up and raising other people's children, raising other men's kids, because that's how evolution works. Cuck it up, cowboy. (laughs) It's time to ride in and take over another bull's calves. Terrible. Of course, it's convenient for the single moms. (laughs) Black hole of resources. Need resources. Need resources. If I can convince men that it's manly to raise another man's children, which it's not... Great. Perfect. And of course, because men in the West comply to the wishes of women, it's why we have a civilization and why women got more rights more early than any other civilization in history or across the world because men defer to women in the West, which is how you know there's no patriarchy, because men defer to women in the West, you get a lot of this propaganda. Because kids are a huge negative in terms of sexual market value. Why do we have sex? To propagate our genes. If you pour your resources into raising another man's genes, you lose! And the four billion year march of your genetics from single-celled organisms up to all the complexity and wonder of who you are stops right there, baby. That's far enough for you. You're going off the exit row called infinite oblivion for your gene set because you got to pour your money into another man's kids. Go feed another gene set. Don't worry about yours. It's only been four billion years of marching upwards and defying predators and getting sunshine and having sex in a field with an itchy ass. But, you know, what does it matter? Four billion year march? I mean, if you've had four billion, why would you want four billion and one? That's just overkill, don't you think so? You go pour those resources into another man's kids. Good job. Way to serve the matriarchy. You know, just in case it's not enough that you pay taxes that get poured into another man's kids, now you can do it directly yourself as well. 
So kids, massive negative intellectual market value. So you need a lot of propaganda. And of course, you need a welfare state so that kids become sources of revenue rather than expenditures, which distorts everything, distorts absolutely everything. Smart people don't try and make money by having kids on welfare because smart people make more money in the free market. But for dumb people, that's ah, a pretty good deal. They make at least as much, if not more, over the long run than they would make in the free market. And I could talk about this in a presentation I did called The Welfare Cliff. I met a woman in America who's got a couple of kids on welfare. If she wants to get off welfare, she needs to earn like $65,000 a year in order to make up for all the benefits. So we can't have single moms with children as liabilities. So we've got to pay for the kids, right? Well, my kids are going to suffer if you don't give me tax money. Okay, so they're basically hostages is what you're saying. So the mom is desperate to date and have a relationship, maybe get married again, but she's got all these kids. So if the propaganda that trains men's like DNA self-destroying puppies to go and pour resources into another man's children, if that propaganda fails, the kids are liabilities. She's got to get them hidden. She's got to pretend they're not there. She's got to drop them off at mom. She's got to drop them off at her friends. She's got, and all the women and some of the men work together to pretend the kids really aren't that big a deal. They're not that expensive. They're not around that much. They're not going to interfere that much. Opening of Jerry Maguire. Oh no, not Jerry Maguire. Helen Hunt. In uh, As Good As It Gets. It's a little too much reality for me because you're coming to kiss me with spit up on your chest. Oh, that man is so immature. <laughs> what he should be doing is lining up to feed another man's DNA because exactly how we evolved, right? So kids experience themselves as standing in the way of mom's happiness. And at some point they get that they're standing in the way of mom's sexual market value because she keeps trying to rope these men in, keeps trying to get these men to come in and commit to her. But why the hell would you want to commit to a single mom with kids? Why? Not your kids. Not your mistake. And the, the, the message is very clear. Very clear. <laughs> and it's the same message that the kids get, the sons get. If you want to date a single mom, well, either she drove a good man away or she's into bad men. If she drove a good man away... Why would you want to have anything to do with her? If she's into bad men and you're a good man, why would you want to have anything to do with her? If you're a bad man, you don't care, but then you're only there for the sex anyway. And so this is what the kids end up seeing. Any man, I'm in with half a brain. And why? Why? It's expensive. They're not your kids. You're not my dad. You, you can't have any authority over them. It's complicated to try and mend meld families together. I mean, you might as well try and crash two planes together in midair and try and make a new plane. I guess once every 20 million universes, it could happen. And and you have the resentful, possibly creepy biological dad of the kids skulking around, getting mad at you, getting tense, getting upset. Ah, the single mom, because she's going to say, well, you know, I got rid of this guy because he was really violent and crazy. He's still around, of course, so... Good luck stepping into his shoes. That should go really well for you. Or she says, which is the usual lie, oh, no, 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 we get along well. We're fine. You know, we just, you know, things didn't quite work out. It's like, oh, okay. So even if things are working out pretty well to the point where you have kids together, she'll still dump your ass for whatever reason. Eh, no reason. I just woke up that day. I looked out the window. I saw a cloud that looked a little bit like a dolphin and it just kind of hit me. I need to dump this guy. Father of my children, husband, this is going to be the person I promise to love, honor, obey till the rest of time. Better and worse than sickness and in health. Eh, but, you know, I saw this cloud looks like a dolphin. Pfft, out he goes through the blowhole, dragged his ass through the court system. He has to go and get some other place to live. He's broke. He's living probably in his car. He's getting to see his kids every other weekend. But, you know, nothing really bad happened. <laughs> That's just what I felt like because I'm a wind-based life form, a Medusa destroyer of men's testicles. I turn him into stone and grind him up into dust. Want to get a coffee? Oh, I think not. <laughs> So, not only is reality and, and, and masculinity and femininity in society completely distorted to rescue the transient reputation of the single mom, but, and not only, not but, but and, and not only, is the live-in, consistent mentoring of a father denied 
to the sun. But the sun has the wonderful and wondrous spectacle of seeing a bunch of trashy losers parading through his single mom's bedroom. Mm. So I'm sorry, son, you don't get a good role model, but, but you do get to see a whole bunch of really terrible role models. Will we consider that a substitute? Sorry, I don't have any food for you. How's a buffet of poison? Now tuck in. Good luck with all of that. And of course, if the mom, uh, there's hypersexualization as well, which again, this is part of the R selected strategy to mess up society is hypersexualize the kids. But there's a big problem as well, because if the mom has said, not only your father was bad, but all men are bad, then he has to ask, why are all these men hanging around? If men are bad, why are men coming over? And very quickly, he's going to be told by siblings, by peers, or he's going to be told, well, because your mom wants to have sex. What sex? <sighs> yep. It comes kind of early. It comes kind of early. And there's a big lie in society as well, because it, it, it echoes and, and reverberates way beyond just your own family. Because you live in the shitty environment called single mother household. But, but... And you know it's terrible. But nobody else tells you. Nobody else reinforces things. Racism, sexism, homophobia. Blah, people go crazy about that stuff. <laughs> right? The pitchforks and the torches come out and the mob gathers and people are pursued into the vacuum of economic irrelevance and their reputations are attacked and they get fired and destroyed. So there is great moral passion and vengeance in the mob. For all of these things that you can't see. Where's all this racism? Wait, is, is, is this my privilege? Where's, where's it all come? Where's it all? So all of these, you see society's hysterical moral attacks against these moral horrors that you can't even see. We've got the army. They're ignoring the pantsers. Crossing the Somme, on the other hand, they are attacking a bunch of ghosts in a far-off kingdom, so good army. <sighs> but the actual things that are causing you trouble, single motherhood, lack of mentorship, succession of trashy men, dislike from your single mother as a liability to her future happiness and sexual market value, society rushes to protect the source of the actual dysfunctions and tribulations in your life. And you can't say anything bad about single moms because then somehow you hate women, right? This is the most boring thing. Ah, this is the most boring thing that you see in society. Yes, you can criticize certain aspects of Judaism. It doesn't mean you're anti-Semitic. Yes, you can criticize certain aspects of particular female nature. It doesn't mean you hate women. Yes, you can criticize certain aspects of black or Hispanic culture. It doesn't mean that you're racist. Yes, you... Ah, it's so boring. It's so boring. And it's just, it's so low rent, so low IQ. I don't even know what to say. It's just one of my basic intelligence tests. Because then, of course, apparently you can just criticize white males all you want, and it's totally fine. I love all this privilege. Could I just ask for it to be reduced just a little bit? Because privilege starts to feel like they're just piling donkeys of disaster on my shoulder, uh, pretty much as high as the Eiffel Tower. But without the protective fencing for enrichment. So, society doesn't say boo to a mouse when it comes to criticizing single moms. But it creates all of these imaginary moral demons that it runs around the universe chasing down and trying to exercise. And you don't see them. The one thing that really is causing you trouble, the single motherhood thing, not only is not criticized, but anyone who criticizes it is attacked. <sighs> A lot of bears in the yard. But anyone who says anything negative or tries to protect the kids against the bears, <sighs> horrible, horrible, horrible. But the imaginary Vorpal bunnies, we've totally got those. Get them, boys! Make them up! Pretend you're fighting! And let the bears through, okay? Because, you know, if the kids get mauled, works for the bears, right? Now, the reason why I think all of this is important, and I look forward to your... I really do. I look forward to your feedback and comments below. The reason why this is important is there's been... For a long time in societies as a whole... The price of getting men to fight is giving them respect. Men will fight to protect women they love. Men will fight 
to protect children they have fathered, for obvious reasons, both moral and biological. But where men are not respected, where men are cucked, significant percentages of men are raising children they think are theirs but aren't. And in England, you can't even get a DNA test without the approval of the mother. I mean, it's madness, absolute madness. And women use the state to pillage men of resources all the time, whether it's in divorce or taxation or whatever it is. Or just through the disproportionate number of women in government work, doing useless paperwork, getting paid, largely from the productivity of men. So if men are not respected, if men are utilized, if men are turned into a form of captive livestock, if men are enslaved to female vanity, to female protectiveness, to female self-defense, emotional self-defense, to female vanity, well, then what happens is the men don't love their society anymore because the society is not giving them respect. The men are in the same relationship to society than an abused woman is to an abusive man. There may be attachment, there may be a, an unwillingness or a lack of capacity to escape, but there's no love. There's no love. And this is one of the amazing ways that you can bypass the natural self-defense of the tribe, is if you set women against the men, if you subsidize women's provoked hostility and pretend LARPing independence, Oh, look, we're so independent. All we need is $65,000 worth of stuff from the patriarchal state in order to survive. Then what happens is men get separated from their wives. They get separated from mothers of their children. They get separated from their children, and they dislike their society. They dislike their society. They feel used. They feel ground up. They feel domesticated. They feel enslaved. But the slaves weren't hated. They were just used. To be used and hated is a horrible combination. There's a rape culture. It's financial rape of men. Emotional assaults on men. Emotional abuse of men is the foundation of the post-freedom society. And what happens then is men don't wish to defend their societies anymore. Men say, with all this hypocrisy, with all this environmental toxin of abuse, with all of this degradation, with all of this hatred, with all of this exploitation, with all of this disproportionate sentencing of men and rending of men's hearts and minds, balls and wallets, through the combine harvester of family courts, through the incessant protection of women and hatred of men in my society. Slave armies don't work. You arm the slaves. <laughs> Saying, go fight the enemy. Well, you're taking a pretty big risk, aren't you? Which is why there's an urge a uh, movement, a tendency to take the guns away from an increasingly exploited population, particularly of men. When you get socialism, you have to disarm. You have to, because socialism is a competing, violent redistribution of resources in society. So how do you take over a society with overwhelming military technology, nuclear weapons and so on? Well, you have to break its will to defend itself. You have to break its will to fight. And that means subjugating the men to the state through the vanity and insecurity of women. Estrogen bioweapon trumps weapons of mass destruction. Because I fear... I wish it weren't so, but I believe violence is coming. Opposition is coming. Competition is coming. The men have been abused, diminished, exploited, attacked for so long. 
Violence is coming. Who will stop it?